Well, we're back for part two of tonight's talk about Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, as I promised, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about trademarks, about some styles that, stylistic uh, points that you almost always run into with a GNS piece. Uh, first of all, and I guess this is more to Mr. Gilbert's credit than Mr. Sullivan's, but uh, puns and wordplay play a great part in the writings of Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, many times a word, multiple meanings of a word, interesting rhymes for a word uh, come into play, to the point where many, many lyricists, including some of the great lyricists of all time, have turned and said that their hero, that the person that, they, that, that, that their biggest influence would be Mr. Gilbert. Um, a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan plots and a lot of their plays uh, cover the law in the sense that it is taken to the most absurd degree. By that, I mean Gilbert and Sullivan were sort of being rebellious, sort of being iconoclasts when it comes to this. If a person, for example, in the Pirates of Penzance, um, there's a character who is indentured to become a pirate, and he's indentured to become a pirate until his 21st birthday. And if you're not already familiar with this, um, come to find out in the plot, he is born on February the 29th a leap year. And so the other pirates sort of say, well, it's just plainly right here in the, uh, in the you know, contract until your 21st birthday. And you haven't had that many birthdays, so according to the letter of the law, you're going to have to be a pirate for four times as long as you thought. Um, there's a character in the Mikado who is an executioner, and when he discovers that he has committed a crime that is worthy of being executed, he spends a lot of time trying to figure out how to cut off his own head. Um, the idea is always there's a law there's some sort of manners that, that, that are set up, and what is the most ridiculous thing if you just follow that to its most, to its furthest extreme? This is sort of their way of poking fun at society in general, which is something they do very, very well. Um, there's an awful lot, Gilbert and Sullivan, what I like to call an affirmative chorus. Now, a chorus back in the day, the Black Crook and some of those spectaculars, we had lots of people on stage, and sometimes they were doing their own thing. They're not necessarily connected with the story that we've all gotten together to watch. The chorus in the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta are the citizens of the town, or the crew of the ship, or the people in the neighborhood who are around, first of all. They are a part of the local color that creates the setting for the play. That's also something I'm sure you're very familiar with if you've seen a, a, a more contemporary musical. That's what the chorus generally is in most cases. But secondly, there's an awful lot that goes on with the chorus pretty much well, I'll tell you how a lot of Gilbert Sullivan is staged. You'll see a main character come forward and sing and state that something is true, and you'll see a sort of semicircle of all these characters in the chorus sort of around that person, so that the main character is basically saying, well, this is true, and then a whole bunch of people around them are basically saying, yes, it's true, it's really true, yes, that's really, really true. Like, they're just kind of backing up what the central character is saying. Note that the main characters are doing the singing themselves. They're not counting on the chorus to do the dirty work of singing, as they, uh, some other groups of singers might have in other periods and times. Um, also, the, the chorus basically backs up the ideas in the play an awful lot. That's, that's their real purpose. Um, in that effect, they're a little, they're not quite like the Greek chorus. The Greek chorus is more of a vox populi. The Greek chorus in ancient Greek plays are often, here's the word on the street. Here's what everybody in town thinks. So in that respect, they do share that with a, an operatic chorus. But an operatic chorus literally reinforces things that they hear said right there on the spot. Um, there are a lot of patter songs that we associate with Gilbert and Sullivan, probably some of their most famous work. Almost every GNS opera has at least, operetta has at least one. Patter song is a laundry list of lyrics, a long list of them, that is sung at a faster and faster pace. In fact, sometimes the character in the story will stop the action and challenge the person in the orchestra pit playing for the orchestra. You know, you can play faster than that, and then they pick up the song and they play it faster, and faster and faster. An awful lot of the lyrics in Patter songs are very complex by design. They're supposed to be a challenge for the person singing it. One of the links you're going to see that I am attaching to tonight's module is uh, Modern Major General, which you may have heard a few times before. Um, it's probably the most famous Patter song, in which the father of Mabel, one of the characters in Pirates of Penzance, is just sort of rattling off all of these things that he's an expert in, from mostly from mathematics and science, uh, at a really rapid pace. Um, the Gilbert and Sullivan world gives us the notion of a finale. Now, 
you probably think with, an op, with um, a musical, you go, yeah, there are a lot of finales. Like at the end of Fireworks, there's like the grand finale, something big happens. But Gilman Sullivan did something else that doesn't quite happen today, and they did it for a reason. Um, remember, they're writing original material specifically for their piece. Theoretically, audiences are going in in their time with a ticket, not having heard any of these songs. So sometimes it's important to sing those songs a couple of times over just to make sure you heard it right, which is why the finale in a GMS show has a lot of reprises. By that, I mean that the end of the show is almost a sort of review of everything we've seen up to that point. Let's live through all of the songs we've heard tonight. And the character who sang the opening song will step up and sing, and then maybe two more characters who sang a romantic duet will do a little piece of that duet again, and some more people will come. The finale was like a, a medley of all the songs that have already been played just being played one last time to give them an opportunity for the audience to applaud again and say, oh, we remember that from an hour ago. That was a great song. Um, you see me use this phrase, deus ex machina. Um, it's a theater concept, and it's also a literary concept, and in this case, it's a little bit of Latin. It means God in the machine. And you see it in a lot of drama, especially um, the Romans and the Greeks would use it a lot, um, and they'd be dead serious. Gilbert and Sullivan use it for comic effect. Deus Ex Machina is what happens, basically, when something comes up at the end of a story to fix all of the problems that you probably couldn't have seen coming any other way. You know, somebody comes out and says, oh, I have a letter here that proves that, that this person should be freed from jail, or whatever it is, some magical person shows up that we haven't met until this point. If this happened in a mystery story, you'd probably be pretty angry. You'd be like, oh, the suspect turned out to be somebody I've never even met. It's just some person came up at the end. The phrase comes to us, this god in the machine, because the Romans in the day uh, would actually bring out on stage, on sort of a great big sort of machine, a giant crane, uh, an actor playing a god, or I guess if it were a more contemporary later piece of god. And you know, if you wrote a really complicated story, and you're like, oh, I've made things so difficult for the hero, I don't know how we're gonna solve this. And then at the end of it, God showed up, and just, well, I'm God, I can just fix it. Just fix everything. Well, that's kind of what happened. GNS found that kind of funny, so sometimes it would happen for sheer comedy at the end of a lot of their plays. The notion of identity is a pretty big one with GNS. Sometimes who you are, both in terms of your name, your job, your title, and yet who you are as a person. A lot of times there are characters who are saying, oh, I wish that I could marry this person, but I am rich and this person is poor. And then as a joke, and this might be a case of the deus ex machina as well, at the end perhaps, oh, my fortune fell apart, I'm poor. Well, hooray, I'm poor too, so now we can marry and we can be happy. Who you are, whether you were separated at birth, as was literally Mr. Gilbert, or whether you were just mixed up or mistaken for someone else happens a lot in these pieces. Finally, Gilbert and Sullivan, as is a lot of Victorian literature, they are very much concerned with class. Uh, by that I mean social class, social stress. Um, there seems to be a difference. There's this sort of American dream idea that we have in a lot of our classic literature where a person, a Horatio Alger type, says, I was born poor and I worked really hard and I rose gradually to the top. Hooray for me. And in Victorian literature, particularly in English Victorian literature, there seems to be a different notion. The idea, I was born a butler and my son will be a butler as well, because to be anything less than a butler would be beneath him, but to be anything more than a butler would be, would be gross, would be terrible and nervy to do that. So I'm going to stay in my part of the social ladder, or my rung. Um, actually, many times Gilbert and Sullivan sort of poke fun at this notion and try to suggest how absurd it is, especially using their law taken to an absurd ex extreme that I talked about before. Now, I mentioned earlier there are three major Gilbert Sullivan operettas. As with many, many musicians, they wrote a lot more than these three pieces, and sometimes the other pieces are a bit derivative. They're sort of like, well, people liked this once, they might like it again. But these are the three that in repertoire seem to come up an awful lot. Um, HMS Pinafore um, was really their first big success, and taking place almost entirely on the deck of a ship, it is indeed a case of a, a love affair between the classes. Um, it is filled with uh, a lot of popular songs and a lot of popular quotes. Gilbert and Sullivan were sort of the Saturday Night Live of their era. People would take 
lines and quotes and anagrams from their work and use them in other contexts to comic effect. We do that all the time. Of course, we don't say things like, well, for he himself has said it. <laughs> I think that that's funny. But stuff like that happens in GNS a, 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 a great deal. One of the problems with HMS Pinafore is that it comes to us from an era where copyright is not quite what it is today. Um, in fact, an awful lot of the folks who put on plays like HMS Pinafore in this time period in the 19th century, um, they didn't really have a way to protect their work. And sometimes a person would be sent into the theater by a rival theater with a notepad with sheet music, you know, blank sheet music, and scribble frantically trying to copy the entire show on paper by hand as quickly as they could. And the next thing you know, another production of HMS Pinafore is opening down the street, except it doesn't exactly have nearly the quality of the original, and nobody's making any money off of it who wrote the original. Sometimes um, folks would resort to rather um, rather dangerous tactics. You can see people kind of show up in another uh, theater. Gee, it's a beautiful place you got here. Crap, you know, it'd be a shame if something was to, you know, happen. And they try to kind of uh, uh, threaten people into not, uh, in, in, into, into not copying their music. But, you know, in the United States alone, um, HMS Pinafore wound up having at one point 15 productions within just a few blocks of each other including an all-child production, and including a production with a completely different ending. And while Gilbert and Sullivan didn't necessarily agree upon every single thing in life, they certainly both agreed that this was not an acceptable situation. And so, in 1879, the Pirates of Penzance, probably the most famous Gilbert and Sullivan, opened. And some measures were taken to try to avoid this problem, especially here in the United States. Uh, Pirates of Penzance made its debut in Boston, right in our fair city, uh, right around New Year's, and it was literally smuggled into the United States. Some people were told that since it was another case of um, uh, a set that looked like a ship, maybe this was a production of pirates that was coming over, but pieces of the production and actors were sent on different ships. Mr. Gilbert and Sullivan both came to the United States, traveling separately as well, and when the Pirates of Penzance premiered in Boston. Gilbert and Sullivan appeared on the stage themselves saying, this is our work, and this is as it should be presented, and anything that you see that is different from what you see tonight, uh, you, you, know, you should consider that to be a counterfeit. And that was pretty effective. That actually worked for them for a little bit. Um, Gilbert, uh, Pirates of Penzance is probably the most uh, quoted and the most performed GNS. It had a very successful revival in the 20th century, actually, in the 1980s. Uh, it was made into a film. Uh, you see a lot of songs from it, and you go, oh, I recognize that a tune as Hail, Hail, the Game's All Here, or uh, something of that notion. And in fact, it's all material from pirates. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, as, as the years went on, and as Gilbert and Sullivan tried their hardest to remove themselves from each other and from operetta, they eventually hit upon a piece called The Mikado, in 1885. Um, the Mikado uh, is uh, set in Imperial Japan. It's probably one of their strongest scores. You can see them trying deliberately to write something more ambitious and more musically difficult. Um, their, their work is a lot more sophisticated than music is. Um, it was a huge success for them. Perhaps I'm not going to say that it's entirely uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not a serious piece, but again, it handles its subject matter rather well. It's a rather romantic story um, about a young man who's willing to risk ex execution just to spend one night with the person that he, that he loves, who has been promised to someone else. Uh, it features some songs like A Wandering Minstrel, uh, Three Little Mates in school, from school, and some stuff like that. And, and you'll hear a clip from that as well, attached to our video. Um, it was remade into something called the Hot Mikado and done in swing style in the 1980s, um, and with, with a lot of success, it, it did quite well as, as that piece as well. It also touched off a bit of the fad in um, late uh, Victorian England and um, late 19th century America. Um, uh, jade, silk, teak, a lot of um, Asian uh, art styles became very, very popular because the settings for the Mikado were very involved and very popular as well. A uh, few other words about this. Um, Mr. Gilbert died under very unusual circumstances. He uh, jumped into 
the ocean to save a drowning woman, uh, was never recovered, disappeared. Maybe he lived longer than 1911, but I don't think so. Um, he was older at the time, obviously. Um, Mr. Sullivan um, uh, died in 1900. Um, he had been living in constant pain. He had uh, kidney stones that went un untreated for his entire life. And for much of the time, it was very painful for him to even sit upright to play the piano. And he would do this anyway, because he knew it was sort of a, a duty of his to get this work completed. Uh, eventually, he did uh, uh, pass away as well. Uh, both of them were knighted. Queen uh, Victoria adored Gilbert Sullivan. Um, but the funny part uh, is that uh, she was much more fond of Arthur Sullivan than of Mr. Gilbert. Arthur Sullivan was knighted by Queen Victoria and made Sir Arthur Sullivan. Gilbert was not knighted until later when he was knighted by Edward uh, after Victoria had died. And many people felt that Victoria just didn't understand that Gilbert was as much of a contributor to this work, and Gilbert hated that. And a lot of those letters back and forth, you know, um, he would write, you know, Arthur, uh, Sullivan would sign a letter from Sir Arthur Sullivan, and Gilbert would write back, Dear Arthur, you know, and not have any um, respect for that title. Here in America, we owe a great deal to the Gilbert and Sullivan stuff. We have the two-act format. We have a central romantic lead uh, male and female trying to get together. We have a chorus of characters who represent the atmosphere. Uh, we have a finale, which doesn't quite do things the way the GNS finales once did, but still, we build toward a conclusion and a curtain call. A lot of that roadmap is set down by this stuff here. What would happen next is that the Gilbert and Sullivan material would sort of merge with those American spectaculars that you heard me talking about in the last module to the point where we get one of the more peculiar uh, periods in the history of the American musical, that of American operetta. If there's ever one form of musical that's probably not due for a comeback anytime soon, I think it's the American operetta, you get the very large, ornate sets, these very high and romantic uh, plots, these sweeping, giant uh, production, uh, overall, the spectacle, uh, coupled with the format of the two-act romantic light motif of a Gilbert and Sullivan piece. And that era uh, would become, well, the, the, the precursor to the American musical. What we get are three major composers that I'll be talking to you about more next time, uh, Victor Herbert, Rudolf Frommel, and uh, Sigmund Romberg. And between the three of them, they produce a great deal of this stuff right up until the First World War because a lot of their stuff is very, very, very much influenced by Austria and Germany. It feels very German. And things that feel very German were not very popular once the Great War started. And as a result, this stuff would really hit the wall fast. But during its heyday, uh, it, it's an incredibly vibrant and an interesting period. It's just one that you probably hear the least about. So it's kind of kind of hard to catch a production of any of the shows I'm going to talk to you about next time. It's easy, however, to catch a production of Gilbert and Sullivan. Savoy Arts across the country, perhaps because they're still very sensitive about some of the copywriting problems that, uh, that their heroes have had, they will come even today. And they will bring their copy of the script and their copy of the score, and they will watch the show. And I've directed productions of Gilbert and Sullivan, where I've had audience members come up to me after and say, you know, you missed this one spot. This point was supposed to say the word uh instead of the, or here's a note that was played incorrectly or something like that. They are really together with their, uh, these are diehard fans, the folks who uh, are keeping the flame of Gilbert and Sullivan alive. And, and they're a very unique brand of musical theater all their own. Many communities, including MIT and uh, a lot of places right here, the Savoyard Light Opera Company here in Carlisle, Massachusetts, has been around for a very long time. I've directed for them. Um, it's, it's a sort of a subgenre and a very popular one at that, but a very, very isolated one from a lot of more traditional musical work. Well, that's the talk on Gilbert and Sullivan. As I said, if you look, you should be able to find uh, some links to their music uh, connected to this module, and hopefully this time a quiz. The quiz should cover some questions from Lecture 1 and some questions from this Lecture 2, and hopefully that will work and we'll be able to get uh, 
a, a feeling of back and forth. Speaking of a feeling of back and forth, please comment. Send me your thoughts on anything that's happening so far, anything I've had to say, any questions that you have. Uh, either email me or, or send something to the, uh, to the course itself. And thank you for pairing with me. It's a great pleasure to be able to do this, but it's also been sort of a learning process. So again, we're making it up as we go along. Uh, thanks again. I'll talk to you next time about American Operetta.